I feel like this used to be the TV industry's best kept secret that just not a lot of folks really realized how many shows pulled their music from libraries. But, you know, thanks to the internet, technology, sample companies, and, and YouTube channels just like this one, the cat is out of the bag, and more and more composers are getting pretty hip to how they can carve themselves out a career writing production music. And if this is you and you're brand new to the scene, then I want to welcome you to the world of library music. You might be interested in it, but maybe you really don't know where to go next. That's why today I want to go over the five steps you'll need to take to start your career in this business. Plus, we're going to take a listen to a Native American inspired cue written by a member of the 52 Cues community on this week's episode of the 52 Cues podcast. What is happening, everybody? This is Dave Croft, and welcome back to another episode of the 52 Cues podcast, a weekly podcast dedicated to all things production and library music, where we talk about industry topics and take deep dives into the different aspects of being a working production music composer. Plus, we feature a cue written by you, a member of the 52 Cues community, and this week, we're going to be taking a listen to Darkness Comes, which is a Native American-inspired cue written by member Ralph Martin, so you definitely Definitely want to stick around for that. But if this is your first time here, welcome. I'm so glad you found us, however you found us. I know you have a ton of options out there, so I thank you for spending part of your day here with me. I also want to give a special word of thanks to the family, friends, and patrons of 52 Qs who help keep the podcast, the channel, and everything here cooking along. We are 100% community supported, so you're not going to hear any ads for mattresses, VPNs, or meal plans. But if you want to learn more about how you can help support 52 Qs and unlock perks like live streams, workshops, uh, Zoom feedback sessions, and a ton more, then be sure to click on the links in the description or stick around because we're going to be talking all about that a little bit later in the episode. So if you are new to the production music gig, maybe uh, COVID lockdown kind of broadened your your mind as far as what can be done you were stuck inside maybe you're a film composer who has who has heard about the production music side of things maybe you're a songwriter and you've caught wind of library music or stock music and you know that you can't just write all the same things and hope it works out or maybe you're fresh out of college or maybe you're in high school or maybe you're on the other side of a completely successful career and you're just looking for something, something to do with this creative itch that you have because you know you want to compose and you know you want to write music and you've heard that there might be a little money to be made by getting your music on TV. Well, I'm here to say yes to all of those things. Production music is its own thing, its own category, library music, production music. I'm using those terms very interchangeably. And music that lives in a production music catalog reflects and sounds similar to the music you'd hear in a film score or the music you would hear in a game, but they kind of play by a different set of rules. And, that, and that's a lot of what we talk about here on the channel, whether it's understanding harmonic language or understanding form, understanding you know, how you can write the cues and how you buoy your creativity. But I want to back up even further than that. And I'm going to assume that you maybe you know nothing about production music, or I don't know, maybe maybe you're a, a, an old vet of the production music scene and you just need a refresher. Well, I've got five things, five steps that you need to take to start your career, or maybe maybe jump yard, jump start a career in production music. And they are step one get the tools. Step two, get the knowledge. Step three, get better. Step four, get brave. And then finally, step five, get on with it. Get the tools, get the knowledge, get better, get brave, and get on with it. So let's unpack each of these. Step number one, get the tools. 
the production music scene has come a long way. And it used to be that uh, it was kind of, I don't know, maybe kind of the, the, uh, the ugly duckling in the uh, media music industry, right? Stock music, canned music, Muzak, the music that, the wallpaper music, whatever. But I'm here to tell you that the bar is very, 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 very high for production music. And we are seeing triple A film composers getting into, into the production music industry. I mean, Hans Zimmer, his team over at uh, Bleeding Fingers, I mean, that's, that's the crew, the same crew that, you know, works on like Inception and Dune also makes production music. So the bar is very, very high. And that's just one example. All kinds of film composers make production music because it is a pretty good way to, to supplement your income. Now, what, what, what's the point of bringing all those folks up? With technology, with these film composers getting into the industry who have access to players, you know, Hollywood players or whatever, the bar for the quality of cues that libraries expect now is very, very high and much higher than it was even, even 10 years ago. Companies like Spitfire, companies like Project Sam, companies like CineSamples, Vienna Symphonic. I mean, they make amazing sample libraries, which are pushing, pushing virtual instruments closer and closer to sounding like the real thing. And so what that means is, is that libraries are starting to expect very high quality, very high quality to the point where it sounds like real players, which means that you have to get the tools, especially, especially if you're looking at venturing anywhere close to the orchestral side of things. Unfortunately, your stock sounds probably aren't going to cut it for long with certain genres. Like if you're doing, again, anything orchestral, anything sample instruments, not synth heavy stuff, but anything sample is probably going to mean a little bit of an investment for you. That's what I did in, in my journey. You know, I started off with stock uh, logic sounds. <laughs> and when I knew that, hey, in order to really dive into this orchestral side of things where I'm doing a lot of strings or pizzicato or horns or whatever, that I invested in my first real kind of grown-up big boy library, and that was Project Sam's Symphobia 1, which to this day remains at the very top of my contact library. I keep dipping into it. Now, that's not to say it's the only string library I use, the only horn library I use, but it's certainly the first tool that I reach for. And over time, I've found other libraries, whether it's uh, Spitfire's BBC Symphony Orchestra, or whether it's CineSample's Brass, which their two-horn ensemble is stellar. But even beyond the orchestral sounds, true, the stock sounds, the stock synths that come along with your DAW, whether it's Ableton or Logic, can really take you pretty far. You can do a lot with those. I mean, I, I'm a Logic user, so I think about Alchemy, and Alchemy is brilliant. I mean, well, they, they did buy it from a sample maker called Camel, uh, not sample maker, but an instrument maker, Camel Audio, and absorbed it and input it right into their, into their DAW and, and made it a stock sound. I remember having the Alchemy app, like for iPad, before Apple bought it. But even then, the edges of the map are significantly smaller than if you start branching out, which means you're probably going to need to invest in a synth like Omnisphere or Zebra or Zebra HZ or Serum. It might even mean, you know, dropping, dropping the, the cheddar on uh, Complete by Native Instruments. My point is, is that if you want to get in the ring with not just Hans Zimmer and Harry Griggs and Williams and, and those guys really like 
taking their Hollywood game and pointing it at production music. But guys, well, frankly, like me, who've invested a lot of time, money, and energy into getting the best virtual performance out of the best virtual tools, then you're going to have to use those same tools. Again, it's not that you can't do this without those tools. But if you really want to throw your hat in the ring, that's what the industry is expecting more and more. So step number one is get the tools. Now, which DAW should you use? Well, I've done a video. I've done a video on which DAW to use, and it's whatever DAW you know best. For me, it's Logic. Before Logic, it was Ableton and Reason. And if it's Pro Tools, if it's Studio One, and if it's Reaper, I'm, I, parenthetically, Reaper Nation is alive and well. I've gotten so many comments from Reaper users just absolutely in love with that DAW. So uh, Kukos is, is doing something right there. So good on you, Reaper people. I see you, Reaper Nation. I see you, and uh, I acknowledge your presence. The, uh, the, uh, the light in me recognizes the light in you. Namaste. <laughs> Go in peace. So the DAW is somewhat DAW agnostic as far as the industry. There are a lot of different tools that can get the job done. And there are a lot of sample makers and virtual instruments that can get the job done as well. Do you have to have them? No. But you're probably going to need them before long. So that's step number one. Get the tools. Which kind of leads into step number two, which is get the knowledge. Study the industry, know how production music is different from commercially released records. You know, I, I teach students all the time about writing production music hip hop, which is different from hip hop that was going to have a rapper on top of it because, you know, you take a rapper off of a hip hop track and what you're left with is a, is a, is a backing beat, which is just going to be too repetitive for most libraries. So things like that, understanding the form, understanding how, uh, how briefs and pitches work. This is where companies like Taxi really come in handy because they will show you this is what they're looking for. This is, uh, the, here are some references. And so you need to do the knowledge work of understanding how the industry works. If you're watching this video, you probably already get that on some level. You know, I hear from folks all the time who who see me on YouTube, who find me on YouTube by either Googling like ominous tension cue breakdown or something like that. And then they just vacuum up everything I've I've ever recorded and they get a much clearer picture. But if you're hoping to to crack into the production music world, not only are you going against guys like me who have the professional tools, but also guys like me who really understand the industry. And you can't just write what you've already always written and just say, well, this will work. I'm just going to take the lyrics out or I'm just going to write something and send it off to the library. They're going to love it. And if they don't, then screw them. Uh, they don't, they don't understand. That's nope. That's not how this gig works. It's very much a service industry. We are making musical commodities, which are going to get used and implemented by someone else fulfilling their, their job, telling their story. So whether it's YouTube channels like this, whether it's Discord, like the Make Music Income Discord, or whether it's the Production Music Academy and Stephen Bedall and what he's doing over there, it's fantastic. Jesse Josephson from Sync My Music, Clint, uh, Anthony Clint Jr. at Clint Music, or 52 cues, the community, becoming a family, our, 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 our friend, subscribing and, and learning and, or, or taking the mastermind 12-week uh, program, all of those things, those are all pouring into yourself and increasing your knowledge so that not only do you understand the tools and you have the tools, but you now know how to leverage those tools specifically to serve the clients that production music needs to serve, namely music supervisors and editors 
I mean, you, your own personal satisfaction is pretty low down, down the totem pole of priorities here. It's about serving the editors, serving the scene, giving editors what they want. So finding places like this channel who can pour into you the knowledge, that's, that's step two. And, and it also doesn't have to be YouTube channels or or uh, or classes. Uh, I have a book right here. This is uh, this is uh, Steve Barden's production music for TV. It's a fantastic book. It lives on my desk. It's wonderful. Talk about like top to bottom. It's amazing. Shout out to Steve. Dan Graham's book, uh, Composer's Guide to Library Music, which inspired this whole 52 cues idea, the idea of writing one cue per week and focusing on the quality cue every single week. Great book. I encourage you to check it out. But step two is getting the knowledge. All right. Step three, get better. Get better at the craft of writing production music. Because once you have the tools, once you have the libraries and the samples and the DAW and you, you know your way around it, and you've learned about the industry, how it works, why we make some of the compositional decisions we make, now it's time to put all of those skills into practice. And the only way, the only way you're going to get better at this is to do it over and over and over and over and over and over again. It's the only way you're going to get better at it. How do, how do I know that? Because if you're new to this, then let me tell you that I am just a future version of you. I've been there. I have been there without the tools. I've been there without the knowledge. But the only way that I got better Yes, I had a couple of a couple of lucky breaks and some good placements early on. But man, easy come, easy go. The only way I've been able to sustain to sustain placements is by practicing the craft and doing this thing repeatedly. I'm up to a close to 700 tracks. Published tracks. And I don't mean like uh, uh I don't mean with all the alts, right? That's that's just original, unique cues. With the alts and stems and minus mixes, it oh my oh my gosh, it's probably probably close to three or four times that. But I have about seven hundred unique published cues in various libraries, from CBS to Discovery Channel to ABC, Bachelor, whatever. And I'm still, still learning about this, and I'm still practicing things that I'm just now learning, because that's the only way it gets better. Now, I, I've recently started cycling. I say recently; it's been about a year. I've, I've started. I've been cycling about a year, and I'm a member of a couple of cycling subreddits. I'm a big Reddit fan, and a question comes up all the time on the sub. And they ask, does this get easier? And the usual answer is, no, this doesn't get easier. You just get faster and you just get stronger. And you only get faster and you only get stronger by putting miles under you. And we have to do that. Write your cues, do the work, start a cue and then finish the cue. And by doing that, you will get better. This is almost a guarantee. You can't get on the other side of having written 500 cues, 100 cues, and not have improved. I, I don't believe it. Not, not if you're, you're earnestly and honestly and in good faith trying to improve. I don't think it's possible to write 100 cues with the tools and with the knowledge and not come out on the other side a better composer. Now, this composer might be 
more better than you necessarily, but it's not about comparing yourself to others. It's about knowing where you are and waking up tomorrow looking to be a better version of yourself. That's that's all I try to be. Because I just want to be better today than I was yesterday. Either a better better at mixing or better at programming or better at uh, organization. Maybe better at being a husband. Maybe better at managing relationships, organizing my time. Better at writing my metadata. Better at coming up with titles. Better at responding to emails. Better at remembering my to do my taxes on time. Maybe better at not getting distracted. Better at hitting deadlines. Better at not over-promising and under-delivering. If I can wake up tomorrow and look back and see how yesterday I was better than I was the day before, then that's a win. That's, that's for me, that's the definition of success. Yeah, absolutely. It has nothing to do with royalties or placements or number of tracks or forwards from taxi or any of that. Because you're only in competition with yourself. And so once you have the tools, once you have the knowledge, focus on getting better. And I would say focus on getting better before you focus on landing libraries, landing the gig. Because I believe in a little bit, if you build it, they will come. Now, we'll talk about step number four here in a minute, which kind of feeds into this. But if you focus on improving the craft and every aspect of the craft, from mixing, to mastering, to arranging, to producing, to time management, all those things that I just mentioned, then the opportunities will start to manifest. And I don't want to get like too deep into that. You know, it's not like the secret or anything like that. And, and uh, even though I do believe in, uh, in, you know, positivity and I believe in the concept of like whiteboarding and, you know, meditation and journaling and all that, I believe in all of that stuff. But if you focus on just improving, then all of those other things, I believe, will get added unto you. So step number one, get the tools. Step number two, get the knowledge. Step number three, once you have the tools and the knowledge, focus first on getting better. So that when you you arrive at step number four, you have the confidence and the courage, which means getting brave. Meaning, put yourself out there. Put yourself out there. Don't, don't sit on, on cues because you don't feel they're good enough. Don't not try to keep improving. Try to get better because uh, nothing's ever going to come, come out of this. Get brave, friends. Put yourself out there. Dean Crepain in his book, Write, Submit, Forget, Repeat. Write it, put it out there, and then forget about it. And then wake up the next day and get on with it. But getting brave does, I mean, it's called brave. It takes courage. Because what if, what if they don't like it? What if you submit to taxi and not only are you out five bucks because it got returned, but they didn't like it. And and that means they don't like me. And what am I doing here? I'm, I'm an imposter. I'm diving into imposter syndrome. And so I guess, I guess I don't need to get better. And I just kind of give this up. If you're watching this, if you made it this far into the show, then that probably resonates with you, but you've already beaten part of the problem. Because on some level, again, if you're listening to me now on some level, you want this. And so you might have to convince yourself, maybe on a daily basis, that you still want this. But I'm here to say that it's very rewarding. It's super fun. 
There's a really great feeling when you get your music on TV, but that's never going to happen if you don't put yourself out there. It's never going to happen if every time you get rejected, you you take it personally. And, and I get it. I understand. You know, it's one thing for us us old timers in the production music industry, and even I'm not as old as uh, some of these other uh, composers I know. But it's really easy for me to say, just don't take it personally. You know, what we're doing here, it's not art. You know, we're just, you know, wallpaper in the background, blah, 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 blah. But on some level, we, we are putting ourselves into this music. On some level, even if it's, you know, jangly ukulele whistling and glockenspiel, you think it sounds good. You like it. Even if it's not a genre you like at all, you know, you might not like, you know, twerky hip hop trap music or whatever. <laughs> That's not a genre, but you get it. But when you write a cue like that, if you write in a genre or style that you don't normally listen to, but you know it sounds good and you feel good about it, that that gets in you. That that trap cue or whatever. That klezmer cue, right? That uh, that EDM trance cue. You resonate with that, and you identify with it because it's yours. And when that when that gets rejected, of course you take it personally. I'd be amazed if part of you, on some level, at some point didn't take it personally. I think there's a uh, uh, there's a there's a pathological quality if if you if you never ever took it personally. I don't know, is that too harsh? I don't mean to cross into I'm not calling anybody out, but there's a difference between not feeling a sting of rejection. There's a difference between that and letting that rejection crush you letting a rejection stop you from doing the thing that you're here to do. There's a difference. I'm trying to see if, if this is a true statement or not. I think every time I've gotten a rejection, I can't, I can't think of a time where I've had a track rejected or I've gotten a lot of notes from a publisher or something like that. I don't think there's ever been a time when I've just gone, huh, that feels great. I'm glad that happened. There's even, even if fraction, you know, it's not a, a, a samurai blade into my stomach. It might just be more of a paper cut, but a cut nonetheless. And like I said, I, I'd be surprised if if you didn't, on some level, some level, feel that way. That's when you really have to be brave. Isn't that like the definition of courage? Isn't being without fear? The definition of courage is carrying on even though you have fear. That's what bravery is. And so I'm here to tell you, friends, get brave. Put yourself out there. You've done the work. You've made the investment of time. You've made the investment of money. You've made the investment of improving your craft. Now it's time to release these things, try to find homes for them, pitch them, and don't let, don't let the rejections undermine what, uh, undermine rather, what you're here to do. And I don't want to say as grandiose as put on this planet to do. I, yeah, I, that feels, that starts to feel a little heavy. But just don't let it stop you. Because if there's one thing every successful composer I've ever talked to, or heck, every successful person, regardless of career, Nearly to to a to a number. Near all of them have the quality of not giving up. So, 
Get brave. Do it. You can. I believe in you. So that's step number four. So once you have the tools, once you have the knowledge, once you have practiced your craft and you've put yourself out there, step number five, which again is related to step number four. See how these all kind of flow into each other? And that is get on with it. Stop procrastinating. Stop making excuses. Stop telling yourself, I'll do this thing when this life situation, event, whatever. Quit telling yourself that. Remember, I'm just a future version of you. I'm right there. What Stephen Pressfield calls resistance in his book, War of Art. The things that get in the way of when you are ready to be the next version of yourself. The next evolution of whatever the universe has for you in your life still requires you to participate in that activity. It's not going to come to you. You can't allow yourself, again, not to get sidelined by criticism and all that stuff, but you also can't get lazy. Can't take it for granted. You have to keep doing the work. Yes, to improve, to get better, but also to keep the momentum going. I was um, talking to a, a business owner, man, wow, like 20 years ago, and he told me about the concept of the terminal flywheel. And, and a flywheel, if you, if, you don't, if you don't know what a flywheel is, you know, an old like industrial revolution era machinery, a fly, and, and flywheels are, are still a thing, but flywheels back then were these giant steel wi- wheels, which helped move. They were usually driven by steam or whatever, and they moved the machinery that made progress and industry happen. But these were enormously large wheels, very, very, very heavy. And so it might take several people to get the flywheel moving, meaning it takes a great deal of energy for the flywheel to start. But once it got going, it didn't take five or 10 people to start it. It only took one person to keep it moving because the momentum of its own weight kept it going forward or kept it moving. It still needed energy. It still needed someone to to keep moving it and put energy into it. It's not a perpetual motion machine, but it didn't take 10 people. It didn't take the enormous energy to lift. Let me say that another way. It took enormous energy to lift, but it didn't take a tenth of the energy to keep it going. And that's really, really stuck with me. You know, this is otherwise known as, you know, in the world of physics, as an object in motion tends to stay in motion. It's the, it's the same concept. Meaning, once you're doing the thing, once you're getting into a pattern, once you're getting into a routine, keeping that going is much easier, much easier than starting from scratch. Just like, you know, exercise or or diet, <laughs> which is why resistance often kicks in. Now, the good news is flywheels usually take a while to stop. And there is a winding down of momentum. And so if you're here right now and you 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 know what that 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 terminal flywheel feels like and where it feels effort, effortless but maybe you've let it slide a little bit well i'm here to tell you that you don't have to start from scratch the momentum of your career of your of your creativity and your creative output isn't starting from scratch you you're not starting at at square 1 you can pick up right where you left off It might take more energy to get that momentum back, but it's not nearly as much momentum as when you first started. Just like, you know, if you're trying to lose weight, 
and you have a day where maybe you made some not great choices, then tomorrow just make better choices. Don't lament that, oh, really crappy and and down on yourself about the choices you made. Just be a better version of yourself the next day. And you'll find that the momentum of going, the momentum of your creativity, the momentum of your output and your routine, you'll pick up right where you left off. Promise. Again, because I'm just a future version of you. I've been there. I've been there with exercise and weight loss and all that other stuff. That's a whole other podcast. Spoiler, intermittent fasting works for me. But I often find during vacations when I will, I usually don't write during vacations, you know, it's a week off. Whether I go somewhere or not is irrelevant, but I usually just kind of block everything out. And I, and I usually eat like crap. <laughs> I sleep in way too long. I, my miracle morning is, is, is just shot. I don't write. And it's cool. It's vacation. And yes, it is hard for me to pull out of that, I don't want to say tailspin, but pull out of that kind of momentum loss. It's hard to pull out of that, but it's not nearly as hard as it is to do to do that from a stop and i find myself getting back into the flow much much sooner so get on with it folks i believe you can do it so get the tools get the tools you need to do the job if you're looking to really do this professionally it probably means a little bit of an investment you can learn a lot without it, but I think, and I am of the belief that if you want to push to that next level, it's probably going to need a little bit of investment. Once you've done that, get the knowledge, learn about the industry, learn about how these cues are put together, learn from people like me or from some whoever you connect with, learn, get the knowledge. Once you have the knowledge, get better, put it into practice. And don't stop. Don't stop just because you've written a cue. Don't stop because you feel like you've arrived. Just keep doing it. And don't stop if you get a rejection because you have to get brave. You have to keep putting one step in front of another and keep putting yourself out there. And when you feel the resistance and when you feel that terminal flywheel slowing down and your creative, your, your creative momentum is starting to grind to a halt, Look at yourself in the mirror and say, Dave, or use your name. I guess you could say, (laughs) get on with it. Just get on with it. Even if it's been several days, a month, a year, get on with it. You'll find it's not going to take nearly as much time and energy to get your momentum back. But what about you? What do you think? What are some of the steps that you've taken? to start your career. And if if you're an old timer, do you have any tips, any suggestions for somebody out there looking to get into this industry for the first time? I would absolutely love to hear from you. Please let me know in the comments below. I read all of the comments and uh, I make an effort to respond to them. So uh, I would really absolutely love, love to hear from you. So we're going to take a quick break and hear a little bit about the 52 Q's community and everything that we have to offer. But on the other side of that, when we come back, we're going to be listening to Darkness Comes, which is a Native American inspired Q written by 52 Q's community member, Ralph Martin. And this is one of several Native American inspired Q's that he is putting together for an album. So we're going to listen to that right on the other side of this break. Hey y'all, I'm Shannon Croft, and I want to tell you that the 52 Cues podcast is made possible by viewers and listeners just like you, composers and producers who are looking for a better way to connect and collaborate. You see, 52 Cues isn't just another website selling static, pre-recorded videos to a mass audience. It's a fun, vibrant, and positive community that comes together online for sharing cues, getting feedback, and discussing what's up in the production music industry. 
You'll find both personalized feedback and live interaction, which are the best and fastest ways to grow your skills and earn more placements. The best part is that the 52Qs community is absolutely free. And when you're ready to take your career to the next level, we offer friends and family subscriptions, which unlock weekly live streams, live interactive group feedback sessions, monthly interactive workshops, and more. Head over to 52Qs.com and sign up today. And while you're there, check out our personalized feedback videos, private lessons, and of course, merch. I can't wait to see you at 52Qs.com. That was Darkness Comes by Ralph Martin. First of all, Ralph, thank you so much for sending this along. I really did enjoy this really nice Native American flute playing. I uh, myself have uh, uh, several, uh, two or three Native uh, native flutes, and I also started learning shakuhachi, so, uh, which is uh, somewhat, somewhat related. And so uh, I've been really enjoying seeing these cues come into our weekly feedback threads. And I know you're putting a whole album of these together. So really, really well done. And I, I absolutely wanted to feature these in one of the podcast episodes. Uh, so, so the first thing out of the gate, let's make sure it looks like we've got a little bit, see how there's, there's, there's almost some, uh, some time uh, doesn't really start right where it needs to. If uh, if you'll you'll, I'm trying to get the little that to move out of the way, but there's a little bit too much of a gap at the very beginning, almost two seconds of silence, and that's going to be uh, that's going to be too much for us. Uh, so we want we want to make sure that we have that happening. Uh, another couple of other things. Um, it, it feels like it's it's kind of like in in mono and it might be the, the the bass drone and that it feels a little little mono-y and so i would be i would be really careful with that and um while well, my, my camera tries to focus on me um be, just be really careful with that uh, and it might be that we could do some sample delay to kind of widen widen that flute 
just things are coming across a little a little mono-y and and the mix is also feeling a little muddy i feel like the low end of that that low boom boom i feel like that needs to be kind of cleaned up just a little bit carve out those low mids and really make sure that that they're really clearly defined of that low end it feels just feels a little bit too mid low mid and mid heavy especially when this bass comes in it feels like they're really all kind of stepping on each, on top of each other right here and also if i back this up good the transition into this next section feels really abrupt Right, it just kind of oh, it kind of chops off a little bit, and the same thing happens if I'm if I'm coming out of this B section. That feels that feels artificially uh, feels like the uh, the the audio tail of your flute is a little artificially cut off a little bit. Whoops, um, come on now. Right here. Like I think that could that could that could carry on just just a little bit more here. Uh, would have liked to have heard that a little a little bit. And going to the end, it feels that it feels like there's there's a it feels like that last note was stretched out, and you can hear the artifacts in that. Right, that that dee dee dee. That you you can you can hear the uh, the sample kind of coming apart a little bit. So I would be really really careful. And if you need to re-record it, then re-record it because right now uh, that it, it feels that feels like digital artifacts that I would probably probably be called out by a library. So I'd be really, really careful there. And so like I said, the transitions, I think maybe some sort of cymbal swell or something so that the downbeat in and out of these sections is a little bit, uh, a little bit, a little bit better. And be really careful, the synth felt a little loud. Wow, 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 wow. I felt, I felt a little loud. Didn't really, didn't really dig that. Um, and uh, quantization a little bit here in the B section. Yeah, it's just feeling, it's just feeling a little swimmy. So I, I would be, I would be really, really careful of that. I like the tone of your, your playing, the, the synth itself, or not the synth, uh, the, the flute is really, really nice. And I'm assuming that that is, that is a, an actual Native American flute that, that you're playing. But thank you so much for sending this along. I absolutely enjoyed checking it out and uh, I would encourage anybody else, you know, I'm a big fan of, of putting real instruments into cues. That goes an absolute long way in the world of production music because so much is virtual instruments that when you get a real instrument out there now if this isn't i think you've done a good job with the programming if this isn't a good job good job with that really really appreciate you sending that along uh, as i said this cue was submitted during our recent week 33 feedback thread over at 52 cues and this is something that we do every single week and if it's something that you're interested in then uh why don't you head over to 52 cues.com and join us and join us and if you found this feedback helpful and you'd like your own personalized in-depth video, video critique of your cue where I break down things like form, structure, harmony, mix, and a lot more, then head over to 52cues.com slash coaching. And while you're over there, you can check out my other coaching services like one-on-one -on -one Zoom sessions where we work together towards your own career goals in production music. So once again, I wanna give a huge shout out and, and, a, and a special thank you to the family, friends, and patrons of 52 Cues who help keep the lights on here. And so, uh, so yeah, that is going to do it for us. And uh, please do hit me up on the comments. I would love to hear from you and let me know what you think about, uh, about the steps of becoming a production music composer. But next week, I have a very special interview with Tracy and Vance Marino who wrote the book, Hey, that's my song. 
So an interview with them where they're going to talk about their book. They're also going to talk about the PMA conference, the Production Music Association conference, and the Taxi Road Rally. The Taxi and I have some uh, Taxi Road Rally news that I'll let you know later. But um, let's just say I might be going to Los Angeles twice in six weeks here coming up. But uh, lots more about that. Be sure to check out uh, next week with uh, Tracy and Vance Marino. For, and they, like I said, they wrote the book, Hey, That's My Song. So I hope you had a stellar week. I hope you had a fantastic week 33. And I know that the universe has amazing plans for you. But we will see you next time. And until then, peace. The 52 Q's podcast is copyright 2022, Dave Croft, all rights reserved. The music played on the podcast is copyright of their respective owners and is used for educational purposes only. For more information, including joining the 52 Q's community and submitting your cue for consideration on the podcast, head over to 52Qs.com.